Today is April 18th, 2012. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Oki, Naganago, Mekoche, Chestakomaki. My name is Red Thunder Woman. My English married name is Michelle Robinson. I use she and her pronouns. Native Calgarian is being recorded on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the opposed US Canadian border are the Blackfeet, and north of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bogani of the Confederacy. These are Treaty 7 lands signed September 22nd, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the West Leech and Key Bears Paw Nations of the Stony, and the Dene from Sutina. I acknowledge all First Nation, Metis, Inuit status, and non status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non Indigenous are treaty partners with government signing on your behalf. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders have been really kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot, Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian Act and Post status card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. My father is so Canadian. I am a daughter of the Mayflower a daughter of the American Revolution, and I have an Indian Act and Post status card. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Hare people, also called the Great Bear Lake people in Treaty 11. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area called Clincho Tinde Intehe in Dene, uh, Satu Dene, meaning Many Horse Town, named after the Calgary Stampede. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretations about Indigenous issues are on me. I encourage questions so that misunderstandings can be cleared up as soon as possible. I don't speak on behalf of all Indigenous. I share what I know as I walk down my red road. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you to the previous donors for already showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. For those that cannot afford to give, I would love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or questions. I also have a YouTube channel where you can go and subscribe. Go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pinned posts on social media. So I had uh, some guests scheduled earlier this week, but you know, it sounded like they were riding their bicycle and got into a car accident. So prayers to them. Um, but I really wanted to start off talking about allyship. Um, so I have as my cover photo on my social media, white fragility functions as a form of bullying. I am going to make it so miserable for you to confront me no matter how diplomatic you try to do so, that you will simply back off, give up, and never raise the issue again. White fragility keeps people of color in line and in their place. Um, in this way, it is a powerful form of white racial control. The social power is not fixed. It is constantly challenged and needs to be maintained. And Robin uh, D'Angelo, who is white, wrote that in an article called uh, White Women's Tears and the Men Who Love Them. And uh, I also have the sources page 110 in her book. I'm assuming it's in her book. I'll have to look it up. But, you know, I wanted to dissect that because I have so-called allies that listen to the show and still don't get it. They still don't understand the whole what we're talking about here. White fragility forms as a form, uh, functions as a form of bullying. What does that mean to a so-called ally? I have no idea what that fucking means to you, but I can tell you that I have been dealing with white fragility all week and I'm sick and fucking tired of it. And I obviously put this up in March. So, I mean, I've been dealing with white fragility my entire life, but obviously, you know, it's been really amplified this week by so-called white allies. So white allies, this is for you. White fragility functions as a form of bullying. <laughs> Just because you don't understand what a person of color is telling you doesn't mean you get to get all flustered and upset and think they're being racist. If that's your go-to, you are being racist. 
because you don't understand white supremacy, you don't understand oppression, and you are using your white fragility as a form of bullying. I'm gonna take it a step further. You and a whole bunch of white people are at a board and having a conversation about a person of color. You are purposely going to use the structure of your organization to go after said person of color because you really didn't like what she had to say. You're being a bully, you're upholding white supremacy, and you're using your white fragility as a function of bullying. This is just the one sentence. It's not the rest of it. And you know, and I'm going to say the rest of it a little bit more. So it talks about keeping a person of color in line and in their place. You are basically saying, I am not allowed to have a voice. You are basically telling me and all the other people of color that we don't want to hear what you have to say. What we have to say about uh, the irony here, folks, it's about systemic bullying and um, systemic racism. They think their opinion matters more than a person of color and most definitely this Dene woman. They somehow even have it in their head. They know more about systemic racism than I could possibly know. And the fact that they think that shows me how racist and demeaning and how, how they see themselves as somebody of more importance and how my voice is not not just equal like it, it's not supposed to be equal it's supposed to be beneath them so they are not helping the very people they think they're helping and in fact by targeting me they're actually being even more racist they're literally doing the very things that they think that they're against so like i can't tell you allies how shitty you are I had to spend an hour on the phone with someone explaining what allyship was again. This is a person who's had years of exposure to me, years of exposure to my social media, years of talking, me talking in this stupid podcast, and they still don't fucking get it. They still don't know what being an ally is. I don't understand how it is allies think they are being helpful when they aren't. Ugh. So read do more if you are not acting you are not an ally it's really that simple you're being racist and you're upholding white supremacy so i wanted to um so my my profile pick on facebook is actually you know to be an ally is two one take on the struggle as your own two stand up when you're feeling scared three transfer the benefits of your privilege to those who lack it uh four acknowledge that while you too feel pain the conversation's not actually about you we are talking about systemic racism it is literally targeting me you fucking idiots i i just i can't understand how people think they're allies and they do this shitty problematic behavior so in order to try to be a better ally um i'm going to uh bring this on share screen and i'm trying to share screen to show you a person who has been doing this work so I referenced um, Emily Lamont and her great work that she's been doing. So I'm going to be putting in my podcast a link to Buy Me Coffee because she is doing this great work that you all need to be doing. Like you need to learn from her. So she identifies as a designer turned researcher, storyteller and writer exploring intersections of community language and cultural theory. She uses a bunch of fancy words to say that she researches and writes about how people speak to each other and how society shapes them. So she has uh, some past and current resources for folks, a guide to allyship, which is what I just told you, uh, people that craft uh, good for POC, to name a few, with more on the way. And why does she do this? For the same reason I do this. Um, her hope is that people will use these resources to better themselves and to be more connected to one each other in kinder ways. I literally need to create a new generation of people to treat my daughter well. I, I don't understand why allies don't see their role in this. Uh, support her work. Uh, one time donations are appreciated, just as many of you do for me, and I appreciate that. But I, oh, look at that. You can actually do more. I should do that. That's a nice reward system for white allyship because I think they need the cookie and this is the cookie that they need. So I'm, I'm going to give that link and um, 
she does have a, a licensing point. So if you're a white person, you're like, oh fuck, I'm so using that for the next time I do my presentation. Might want to check out her license and her terms of corporate and commercial use. I mean, I don't make any money at this and I'm native. And so like, this is a way different. I don't monetize any work I do. So I'm just showing it to you so that if you are one of those people that are like, I am gonna record Michelle and take every bit of information and then use that information to do my own um, diversity training, then, you know, one, you should be paying me, but you know, she has put this out here and I'm hoping you would put it out there too. Um, so she actually has some information about that. And then she actually has her whole guide to allyship. And, you know, you, if you find it useful to actually pay her. So I ask you, give her a buck, please give her a buck. Cause she has so much stand up when you're feeling scared, own your mistakes and decenter yourself. Like, fuck man, I wish, like, I wish there was a lineup of people out there who have been harmful to me in the course of my life to actually say that they're fucking sorry for the centers they've made or the, the mistakes they've made and decentered it about them. Like it literally is about racism. It's not even about me. Like if you are literally fighting the name change of Langevin School, you are making it about you. <laughs> this, this isn't about me. This is about Indian residential school survivors. I wish people understood it. Understand that your education is made up to you and no one else. You know, I wish people read more. There's so many uh, resources out there. I'm literally showing you this in the hopes that you will see that there are tons of resources. I mean, the Calgary Public Library has all these books. Like, what are you reading? How can you not get it? The Settler Book Club exists. My book club exists. So how can you not figure out what this is all about? How to be a good ally? Like, I, 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 I guess, do you have to read this every Sunday? Can you make this your Sunday work? Maybe that way we can see some changes in like, you know, policy reforms and having indigenous people and people of color at the table, you know, trans people with accessibility issues. I don't see them at the table. What are you guys doing? So I had to go a bit on a rant today about shitty allyship because unfortunately, I've been experiencing it so much this week because God forbid I spoke out and told people they're not doing a great job at being an ally. <laughs> not sorry. Um, so I also wanted to talk a bit about um, uh, the Jason Kenney curriculum that has been out there because I haven't really got a chance to talk about that. Um, I have uh, <laughs> some really great uh, tweets that I wanted to read out to you because uh, they're so good. So I'm going to share the screen again and uh, so that you can see this fabulous bunch of stuff. So uh, I'm Indigenous. My friend Dr. Pam Ro Roach here, well, she's on Twitter. So you all can see this on Twitter anytime you want to. I'm going to put a link in there so that you can please like it and amplify it. And uh, so today is what, the 18th? So this is already two weeks old. Um, Monday holiday, took a deep dive. Oh, and you should know she's like an educator. <laughs> she like, works at the University of Calgary. It's right on her bio. You just have to look. Um, so she took a deep uh, dive into 52 pages of the draft of the K to six uh, social studies curriculum, 137 PDF sticky notes later have some thoughts. <laughs> the curriculum is deeply ideological. Um, so like, you know, folks, it's so funny. The very people that complain about the so-called cancer, can, or cancel culture are the very ones, per, you know, perpetuating it. I mean, I'm only 44. I remember when everybody wanted to ban Marilyn Manson or Madonna. And now we have this I think it's a little Nas X. I'm sorry. I know all the young young kids are like, oh my God, this woman. <laughs> sorry. Anyway, like so deeply, deeply ideological religion aside, let's save that for another thread. It's staunchly capitalist. Well, at least we're teaching our students to be good little neoliberals. Brief mention of collectivism and various indigenous societies mentioned societies developing not extracting um, natural resources. Oh, I hate the terminology they use towards Indigenous people. 
The curriculum is deeply racist in many ways. One of the most noticeable, the continual reference of indigenous people in the past tense, had different languages, had traditions and protocol for different, for gifting, lived in these areas. Um, hey, still here, still thriving. And you know, TikTok, I've seen a couple of TikToks that were basically saying, okay, now that all you white people know that we are still here and that we still live here, here's some things you, to get you caught up from your, you know, uh, 200 year ago ideology, which is clearly what Mr. Kenny and his uh, stooges are all are perpetuating here. This curriculum is weirdly focused on native or on American history, American residential schools, a little big horn. It also states Indian residential schools ended in the 70s, not 1996. I graduated in 94 folks, so they were still in existence two years after I had graduated high school to give you that perspective. While we're at it, Métis not only uh, mentioned occasionally, Indigenous people often specified uh, or specifically referenced only as First Nation and Inuit when information would also apply to Métis. Yeah, and that's the whole thing. Like, the erasure of us in past tense isn't even bad enough. It's the concept that we, are, we will, won't even give a proper history and dialogue of all of this. Uh, TRC and residential schools only mentioned starting in grade five, this should be taught starting in kindergarten as per call to action 63. See guys, it's not just me, other people fucking point this out too. Um, so, you know, it, I don't know, we need so much systemic structural change when it comes to all of this, and I still feel like we're not even kind of close to having that conversation yet because people are still uncomfortable with it. So um, yeah, that's where we're still at. Nice try at erasure here, but indigenous people are very much alive. Hi again, we are the descendants of survivors. Notice no quotation marks needed. We are resistors, rebels, and we will not be quieted. It is also dripping with Euro ethno -centrism. My dad is British. My husband is British. I lived there for five years. Uh, this has more British nationalism than the local pub. <laughs> but <they're... laughs> That's pretty funny because uh, all I know about, well, I know a lot about British, unfortunately. I wish I didn't know a lot, but um, like they're nuts about their nationalism and rightfully so like they they legitimately think not just our commonwealth like ours like they own the commonwealth they own you know australia and canada and they do technically because their queen lets them and everybody's still really cool about that so you know it's so funny uh uh so prince william died and i got to see and this is part of the reason too why i'm like you are all super shitty allies because you're all like oh my god i'm so sad for the queen Yes, I'm so fucking sad for her too. She's fucking old. None of us get that old unless we live like the life of privilege, you motherfuckers. So every time you're like, oh my God, what a life. Oh, she's such a great queen. What the fuck did she ever do for you? And I mean that. Like everyone's talking about, oh my God, Prince William did such a life of service. I grew up in Sea Cadets. I know what a, a Duke of Edinburgh award is. That doesn't mean they fucking gave anything to us. What the fuck did they ever give to us? You know, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh award that I seen, you had to work pretty goddamn hard for it, number one. And number two, it's not like they paid for any of that. You know, you had to get yourself up to Edmonton to actually get the stupid award. You know, like it, it did so many barriers, but to people who know, don't know what privilege and barriers actually are, they're like, oh my God, the poor queen sitting alone. Jesus fucking Christ, my, my mother-in-law has been sitting alone since my father-in-law died, what, 12 years ago? Nobody feels sorry for fucking her. Uh, or what about, you know, all of the people who died during COVID and had to like not do a proper burial? There's lots of people like that. So, I, you know, like I, I wish allies understood when you share your loyalty to the queen, how fucking disgusting and gross it is and it perpetuates this idea it's okay to own natives and kill them and commit genocide in order to own this land so like please just shove your fucking monarchy attitude up your fucking ass and leave it off my facebook page please don't friend me why are you friending me like if you love the monarchy why the fuck are you friending me these are people who have literally perpetuated genocide against their people and you guys are like oh my god they've done so much for us bullshit they've done shit for you Anyway, 
I mean, like, who I would say maybe an AIDS victim that had seen uh, Princess Di like hug somebody who had AIDS. Like she did more for anybody than I had ever seen. She actually tried to fight landmines going in. You know, like I, I just can't wrap my head around this. Oh my God, he gave so much service. Nobody knows what public service is. You know, somebody paid me fucking millions of dollars a year. I promise you, I could give you some good public service too, especially if I was born into it. Jesus Christ, people. Anyway, back to this. Uh, this is part of the rant though against Jason Kenney. I mean, Jesus Christ, why are you worshiping these motherfuckers? Anyway, also comes, uh, it also seems like the UCP like to talk about Robin Hood. <laughs> oh, the irony, when Robin Hood would have been fighting with us. It's like, it's like all of these Bible, Bible thumpers who don't recognize that Jesus was like walking with the sex workers. Anyway, same thing. It is ironic, feeding serfs. Uh, we'll be sending back our feedback, good for her, um, and tagging, obviously, the official opposition, rightfully so. And uh, and then two days later, obviously, after processing it posted, uh, after hours spent on the curriculum, we finally submitted our feedback. I will save you the three-page letter um, that we've also cc'd, but we also have a number of questions. And I thought this was really important for so-called allies to understand. Um, you know, how the government plans to take the feedback from the uh, Albertans and move forward to improve the draft curriculum. I think we all know that's not going to happen because it's them, UCP. Um, how will the government strive for, to improve transparency with this process? They're already lying about all of this. We know it won't happen. Uh, what do you as our MLA uh, will do to advocate for our concerns of our constituents? There is no way Peter Singh has a fucking clue what I'm talking about. Like, he's brand new to Canada. He has no idea what Indigenous issues are. So like, I know, and that's part of the reason why UCP stacked the MLAs with a whole bunch of new immigrants that don't actually don't know anything about Canada. Um, how does the government plan to engage in true reconciliation with Indigenous people who have responded to this draft curriculum to explain how appropriate it is? You know what? It, this is the unfortunate part. I know there's some like Dr. Pam Roach, obviously, as a professional, has a, a total obligation to do this. And I'm, I'm so grateful to her and so many of the in, other Indigenous um, educators out there that took the time to do this because they do speak on my behalf. Um, but the truth is that this UCP government doesn't care about reconciliation. They've made that, I mean, Jason Kinney was clear about that federally. Um, you know, the apology didn't mean anything with the Indigenous uh or the indian residential schools didn't matter to men every policy since that moment they just clearly did not care about indigenous sovereignty and their and our rights they are very clear in this curriculum they don't care about reconciliation the opposite they're perpetuating more um british and american uh neoliberalism so uh it's a it's a real shame that canadians can't comprehend this i'm i'm really sad for that but you know this is where we're at folks um, I swear we're at, like, if you legitimate, like, I mean, I can't even get lunch in school name change for Christ's sakes. And, and people are like, oh my God, I'm just, I mean, try not there, but never wrote that letter. You not writing that letter shows me how much of a so-called ally you actually are because you're not doing any action. And very clearly, white people in positions of power do not listen to indigenous people and not just white people but you know all of these new immigrant mlas they don't care they just want to steal our land just like all of the other ones before them doesn't matter what color they are now oh what do you expect us as parents to say to our indigenous children when they come home from school and tell us about racism embedded in their education they don't they want you to conform that's the whole point of this exercise as well is that they don't want indigenous kids they want trauma inflicted indigenous children by teaching them racism and allowing a society be raised to be racist against indigenous that's that's my take um so you know i i would love for canadians to write me and say oh no 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 that's not how we feel but guess what my inbox is empty so I know that's how you feel. I mean, if you can't write a letter to the UCP, I know you sure as hell ain't writing a letter to me. So, you know, um, I guess for me, it's just that bigger point that, you know, if you care about the curriculum, you know, write your letters, tag me. You're not tagging me. I know you're not writing letters because it doesn't matter to you because technically you benefit 
by this imposed racism on all of our children and continued this racism in our society. I mean, you know, you still think you're an ally and you're not calling out people at a board meeting who are purposely um, targeting an indigenous woman when they claim they care about um, systemic racism. And we know they don't, so it's all a fucking joke. Anyway, 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 anyway. So I uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the vaccine. Uh, so the vaccine came out and um, like one person in Alberta had a reaction. So now uh, all vaccines are unsafe. Did you know? Yeah, I didn't know either. So I wanted to talk a bit about that. COVID-19 is a very serious disease. This is something that once you get it, like, yeah, sure, 90% will probably be fine. But the 10% that aren't, that end up on the ventilators or admitted into a hospital, that's the problem. Is our, our, we're in the middle of a third wave. Um, our hospitals are overstretched. We actually don't have the resources to pay overtime because Jason Kenney doesn't want to pay overtime for our nurses and doctors and and medical uh, folks. So I really can't encourage people enough to get the stupid vaccine. I got the vaccine because I could, uh, you know, card carrying native. So I was allowed to get it. Um, I, I it, There was an age cutoff, but at the end of the day, when there's lots of canceled um, uh, appointments, there's still room for people. So I went and got my shot and I'm not feeling bad about it. And I don't think anyone should too. And I don't think I should have to justify my health issues to anyone as should nobody else. We need to get as many people in with these shots as possible. I talked to my doctor about the ethics of me getting a vaccine over others. And there's lots of unused vaccines happening in Alberta for a lot of reasons. One of them, we don't have the staff because the UCP are completely inept at getting any of this done. Um, but the bigger picture there is that uh, we have a lot of vaccine hesitancy. I had a wonderful family member I love very much said to me she was concerned about getting the vaccine. And I'm like, and, you know, we have to convince people that the risks of getting the of COVID-19 actually are outweighing the risks of getting a vaccine. And especially if you're telling, you know, kids to get the vaccine and our mothers to get their kids vaccinated for every other childhood preventable disease, so-called, I'll say that, you know, I'm a big believer in informed consent. Um, I'm a big believer that a lot of these vaccines actually don't have informed consent, but we are in the middle of a global pandemic and we, are, we do have a, a group of people that are dying. And I think that this vaccine, um, I mean, Every vaccine is made off of decades of research, whether or not it's good or not and to your standards doesn't mean it's not, um, you know, something new. It's not like the smallpox vaccine where we never did it before. This is decades of research and being able to find the design was a big deal uh, to be able to design the, the vaccine to help protect people was a big deal that it was in development. This is actually an amazing moment in time to talk about the importance of science and medicine and previous research, why investment into science and um, medicine is so important for this moment right now that we're experiencing. I understand not wanting to get the vaccine, but you know, I'm here in Alberta and I, I, I'm, I'm at the point where it's very clear to me the populace is so uneducated about science, medicine, um, democracy, freedoms, rights. Uh, it, it's a sad time. It's a sad moment. But it's really easy to see how Hitler and the Nazis could just kill so many people and have everybody be okay because that's what has happened here in Canada with Indigenous people. And people are more concerned about getting their double double from Timmy's than they are about, you know, writing a letter to the UCP to tell them how problematic this curriculum is. That's where we're at, folks. So I'm really sad to see so many people have vaccine hesitancy on this. Um, I'm uh, COVID-19 is disproportionately representing people of color and indigenous. We are dying because we've had systemic healthcare failures. Um, you know, when I, we had our guest, Corey Ashley, come on to talk about the death of Lillian, we actually didn't talk about it being about COVID-19. 
but we talked about how poorly Alberta Health Services treats uh, Indigenous women. So I got that shot knowing that if I didn't get that shot, if I have to go to the hospital, those doctors and nurses will treat me like a bag of shit because they can, they get away with it because people want a double double from Timmy's more than they care about our rights and freedoms as Indigenous people. You know, they would rather fight wearing a, a fucking mask. And that energy that they put towards, you know, this mask, you don't see them put it towards me. You don't see it, them put it towards the Indian Act. You don't see it put it towards Lily and Ashley's death. You should have people just like the Black Lives Matter movement has, you know, erupted and, and you know, really ignited people to be like, this is wrong. We don't see that for Indigenous people in Canada. We can see two Métis uh, men get shot and killed by other people and everybody seems to be okay with that and it's not okay. Um, racism is so normalized in Alberta. It's so gross. And people don't even see their roles as allies in stopping this, in, you know, amplifying, okay, you fucking hate me, cool. There are natives clearly, you know, in the comment sections that you can like, you can amplify their voices. There are other Indigenous podcasts, other Indigenous leaders that you can like and amplify their voice. And you're not. Why? The fact that you won't is the systemic bias that you're showing us. That you, you are more excited about the, the double double Timmies than you are about, you know, standing up for so-called rights and freedoms. Yesterday was Charter Day. Why don't I know that? Why don't you know that? Why don't you know what it means? Anyway, it is what it is. So I'm going to kind of shift everything because I fucking hate media. I'm angry about the way Canadians are towards Indigenous people. So if you are just tired of all of this, I am. I'm tired of listening to myself. I want to bring you to Big Brother. Normally, I don't give a shit about Big Brother, but it's COVID-19 and I'm doing the right thing, staying home. My family's staying home. So I've got a lot of extra time to watch some TV. And Big Brother is kind of their shtick. They really like it. So I've been invested, unfortunately, in Big Brother more so than I've ever been. Now, I don't really know all of the rules when it comes to, uh, you know, allowing to showcase um, global news clips and stuff. So I'm just not even going to go down there. So bigbrothercanada.ca. I'm not going to press on any, any other videos. So I wanted to just show you um, so if you're Albertan, I know I, I look at the demographics of people who listen to me. I know I have lots of Albertans. So, um, so first of all, Braden White is from Calgary, a uh, very clear, queer black man who's just living his queen self on Big Brother. And um, yeah, I really like him. Beth is Albertan. Beth is a social worker from Alberta. Uh, Judson, personal trainer, so he walks around without his shirt on all the time, so if you just want eye candy, you can watch um, for no other reason than that. And then to Sean, he's apparently an urban planner. So I actually did a shout out to my friend Jay Pitter on Twitter. I'm like, hey, you know this guy? Because she's in Toronto and he's in Montreal. Um, so I was wondering if they had known each other, but I guess other urban planners did, or designers had known about to Sean, so seems to be like a community activist I'm super excited about but who I really want to talk about was Kiefer more than anybody so just really wanted to quickly show you Judson um he's having a showmance showmance with Beth and they even put it right in here <laughs> charming personality so obvious Beth yeah so this is our social worker here from Alberta homeless support worker from Tomahawk Really? <laughs> uh, and guess who she's targeting? The one native guy. Of course she is. Don't get me started. So I wanted to, to show you all, if you're native, if you are an ally, like, man, this is the best freaking season for diversity. Let me tell you. Oh my God. So he's adorable. I'd press play, but I don't know. Then Global might shut this podcast down. I don't fucking know. Um, really laid back, really nice guy, uh, love him to pieces. Uh, Judson, this was the urban planner guy I was telling you about, or no, no, Tishan is, there we go. 
There's Tashan. So, yeah. Tashan and Judson just show up all the time without their shirts on. So it's like, okay. <sighs> but he's 29. I'm 44. So that's gross, Auntie. Anyway, really like him though. Really nice guy. And I wanted to showcase this at narcity.com because it talks about Kiefer. So he's from Haida Gwaii, way out uh, East Coast guy. And apparently, yeah, his partner is gorgeous. I don't know who she is, but um, they have, it looks like uh, two tw uh, twins and a son together. And he really is the sweetest guy. He walks around with his moccasins all the time, happily shacked up. I don't think by colonial standards, I think by our standards. So yeah, and raising twin daughters. They also have dogs. Ah, gross. Rob Ford, retreat, retreat. So please, um, we're so, so much has happened in Big Brother Canada and it's been super exciting. Things that we thought were gonna happen didn't happen. So we, we even like were a little late on watching this one episode where we thought for sure they were gonna get rid of Kiefer and they didn't. So uh, I was on stupid Twitter and I seen that he was still on their, their cams. I'm like, what the fuck? He was supposed to be kicked off. So then I got the family and we all watched it and they didn't kick him off. And then they told us something that's coming up and I don't want to tell you in case you actually listen to the show when you, I, I upset you. I don't want to give too many spoilers. So I really want to see people start cheering for this guy because he's a really fun dude to, um, I don't, he's just been like one of the highlights actually of the stupid pandemic. And I hope to God I can get Kiefer or, so if you're from his community and you're hearing me, please ask him if he can be on my show when, when and if it's all done. Cause I would love to hear it from him. My husband is convinced the only reason why I care about Big Brother Canada this one particular season is because it has him in it. And I'm not going to deny or confirm that at this moment. <laughs> really nice guy though. So really wanted to encourage that. I really wanted to encourage people to get their uh, vaccine shots because uh, I think it's really important that we um, try to get herd immunity. I mean, I live through Motley Crue and uh, drinking in Sylvan Lake, and I'm really, you know, think I'm going to be okay with the stupid vaccine. And so far I am. I've heard that it's actually the second shot uh, from numerous people, how, how they reacted to the second shot was actually super crappy. So yeah, that's happening. Um, one other thing, we've had a major rocky um, week in our life when it came to job prospects and possibilities so tomorrow we find out if like they're serious give them a real contract and we might be moving so heads up i don't know i mean it's been a possibility for the last year financial instability has been really super shitty but i'm not gonna lie having um this wonderful uh serve and unemployment it's so funny to hear people bitch and complain about government because if we didn't have somewhat of these social structures set into place this family would have really really not been doing well i'd also like to give a shout to uh you save it's urban society for aboriginal youth um if you have money please donate to them because they've been actually uh, really kind and supportive to my daughter giving her not just activities but uh the, some of the monies that the federal government has given for urban indigenous youth She's been one of the benefactories of that. And I, I just can't go on enough about the great work that you say does and gives her like a peer support group of people um, to be with. Like, cause, uh, cause that matters the most to us, especially now that we have to homeschool because uh, you know, this <laughs> a funny thing about the Alberta curriculum. It's so bad today in the current form that it's not safe for indigenous kids to be at these schools. And of course we're incredibly privileged and lucky to be able to pull our daughter and to do the homeschool thing. But most, most Indigenous kids are forced to be in these traumatic, racist environments that don't appreciate them and don't uphold them as, as the people that they should. And quite frankly, all of the non-Indigenous kids are learning all of this awful problematic behavior through the stupid educational curriculum that I, very clearly CBE is like, it's too bad for Indigenous kids. Ah! We're not changing nothing. So they think they are, but they're they're told me on their board meeting they were perfectly content with status quo. So it's uh it's not right, it's not okay. And 
there is one light at the end of the tunnel of possibly moving is that we'll just get away from this. But at the same time, that means 1.3 million Calgarians are still a okay with the status quo, still a okay with being taught racist uh, dogma, being taught, um, you know, Indigenous people are somehow in the past. So, you know, I, I can't stress enough how the media can, is complicit in this. And I hope that people really question what they're reading when it comes to Indigenous stories and start putting effort towards reading Indigenous authors, Indigenous leaders, Indigenous works, and go from there. So I think with that, I'll wrap up. I'm really proud that this podcast has given solutions and included you know, cultural safety training, cultural first aid, and almost all of my podcasts, I give resources for a safer place for Indigenous people of color, those with a disability, LGBTQ plus to speak. You know, I, I talked really hard against allies today. So I want to ask you, if you're an ally and you've been listening to this podcast, what, have you learned anything from what I've said? And how has, how has that become an action in your life? Because I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see how, how this has somewhat impacted you. And if not from me, maybe a Black Lives Matter um, you know, speaker, uh, resource that came from that movement, um, you know, first uh, a, a Facebook group or something like that. I just stumbled upon a Facebook group that uh, is secretive. So I can't say their name or anything like that, but I can tell you. Um, if you've listened to me on this podcast, I've talked about how algorithms stop people from seeing my posts and see other Indigenous posts, how it stops them on all social media platforms. So that's why it's actually really vastly important. If you think you're an ally, you go out of your way to like and retweet actual Indigenous uh, social media, because the algorithms are set to um, actually dismiss us. So um, anyway, this particular group, they go out of their way to promote positive comments that they see on social medias, on um, you know news articles and such like that. So this is exactly the type of structure I wish I could, I had the time to create, but I don't. And these are the people doing that work. So there are other people who are starting to see it and do it. And I know um, once I find out more about them and what they're willing to tell, I'll be promoting that so look for it. And if you see positive posts of like progressive people speaking, freaking like them, promote them, all of the rest of it. And also we have a federal election coming up. So if you think that you see somebody who would be a really good municipal or a um, uh, member of parliament to represent your federal riding, fucking promote them, endorse them, volunteer for them, fundraise for them, you know, get them going. And I don't care what political stripe you are. I mean, I'm a liberal. And I wish that people would do that for Indigenous liberals. That's why I'm part of the Indigenous Peoples Commission. Found out there's people who still don't know what the Indigenous Peoples Commission are, you know. So I had to write an article for the liberal like inner circle that we have. It's it's so frustrating. These are the people who think they're my fucking allies. They don't even know what I do. Um, so if you you know like engage with people on this stuff, like. I, I can't stress this enough. Non-Indigenous people cannot be chairs on liberal boards. It's, it's really that simple. You need Indigenous people in those positions. So, and if you don't have one, then that means your atmosphere is so racist. Indigenous people don't want to be at your board because there are Indigenous people that definitely want to see not conservatives in fucking Alberta. Anyway, uh, so I want to say uh, here to help.bc.ca um visions indigenous people volume 11 what is indigenous cultural safety why i should care about it, it has some good resources it was created by authors cheryl ward chelsea branch and alicia fritkin and i had said that in like i don't know 100 episodes so those are cultural tools um that support indigenous people and, and they could be a part of your reconciliation work and your settler understandings i'm just lucky enough to highlight it and repeat it here Internalized racism or lateral violence is another form of violence Indigenous and marginalized people experience by the structure of racism imposed on these lands. So we have the Indian Act, Indian residential schools, land clearing policies, all of this has created lateral violence and internalized racism. 
So Donna Bevins, uh, racialequitytools.org. Those have some great information about internalized racism. You can Google, you can Google what is internalized racism. Come across some of these tools. Uh, do's and don'ts for bystander interventions uh, by American Friends Service Com uh, Committee. That's one I've been putting out for uh, hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of podcasts. Um, if you experience racism here in Alberta, act to end racism or text at eight or 587-506-3838. Indigenous people have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas and reports, commissions and public hearings, so it can be regularly disregarded, much like the stupid Alberta curriculum. No more, honor our words, honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. If they don't recognize marginalized with, in their budgets with gender equity plus, if they're cutting violence prevention programs and services, Indigenous education, uh, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, lack of human rights for migrants, Immigrants, folks with disabilities, know that your vote to that party directly impacts marginalized people. Demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, the recommendation of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, multiple reports, child welfare reform, violence prevention programs, and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit. Denying these reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in education and health and justice institutions with multiple reports to say the same thing. Uh, demand action, change from election platforms and politicians. Uh, you're seeing this municipally here in Calgary. We have uh, new folks that are putting in their names for school trustees, for councillors and mayors. They don't know if they have no clue what anything I'm talking about is don't fucking vote for them and call them to account on this. We actually have um, a piece in change language of in school. We're making it an election issue. Like if you can't challenge your school trustees on this, this issue and they don't know what we're talking about, then please don't vote for them. Should be understood by all parties, local politicians, community organizations. They don't understand colonialism, racism, privilege, sexism. They have zero business running. A uh, really great episode, or article I said out loud is Truth Before Truth, How Non-Indigenous Canadians Become Allies. Great, great article. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything we talked about today and want to talk, First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It's 24 um, 7 you can also text at hopeforwellness.ca if it's more related to missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, 1-844-413-6649. Uh, it's toll-free, 24 hours uh, support. If you're non-Indigenous, there's distress center lines in your area, usually a functioning 211, or call 833-456-4566. If you see or experience racism, report it to end to act racism or text at 587-506-3838. And there's a trans lifeline. Uh, there's one in Canada, one in the US, the Trevor Project for LGBTQ2 plus youth. There's a LGBTQ2 youth support peer group. You can even text. Um, and of course the kids help phone if you're in Canada. I want to thank lifevoice.ca for those um, LGBTQ2 plus crisis supports. Every time you hear some stupid fucking politician or the Pope or somebody talk about how, um, you know, they're shaming LGBTQ2 plus in any capacity, just share those, please. Because every time somebody who identifies under that spectrum hears it, they're, they're suicidal. Not all, but enough. One is too many. Can't believe these stupid politicians. Jesus Christ. Uh, violence is my everyday reality. Every Indigenous generation has faced it. That's why I started this podcast to speak freely without interruption, without tone police. <laughs> How many people I blogged this week with? Well, actually, when talking about Prince Philip, like they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't even know what oppression is. Um, same with these stupid Grace Life Church people. Leadership shaming, gaslighting questions. People don't want to hear Indigenous opinion, but they sure want to tell us theirs, even though they know nothing about us, uh, know nothing about colonialism, the constant surveillance of Indigenous people, our protests, our vigils, our rights. 
microaggressions, people dealing with internalized racism, those who are gatekeepers, live off the status quo, who are in their trauma, who stop people from doing the good work and deplete personal resources. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for Indigenous people. I want to say thank you to my ancestors, uh, my granny, my gra great grandparents, my uncle, um, who, you know, he's passed on, my mom. Oh, I'm going to be thinking about an aunt and uncle from Yellowknife. They're in Edmonton Hospital right now while they try to figure out what's going on with um, a surgery that went, I don't know if it went wrong. I don't know. Anyway, you know, a lot of people helped me be at this moment right now. Thanks to them. Thanks to their strength. Thanks to their example. And I'm grateful for that. Uh, my family, my dad <laughs> taught me to be strong and blunt. My stepmom uh, showed me what a proud culture is through her Austrian roots. And uh, she taught me to be a proud Calgarian. And just through her, I'm a second generation proud Calgarian. But for folks who don't know, I named this native Calgarian because there's nothing more insulting as an indigenous person than having somebody call themselves a native Calgarian. I always go, really? What nation are you from? <laughs> anyway, thank you to my husband, Darcy. We just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary um our 28th wedding or 28th year being together um we decided to get married on the day we started dating so three years later and uh on top of being my husband and producing and editing the show he's been a childhood friend of mine uh father of our child my support down the red road journey he's witnessed decades of racism and sexism he's the one who shoved this microphone in front of in front of my mouth and said start talking <laughs> And uh, now we might be moving for uh, a new job, new industry even. Well, I'm hoping that works out because we would really wanna be ourselves and be out with who we are and uh, you know, go from there. To our child who we are blessed to learn from daily, we are honored you chose us. Uh, you give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. I hope one day my daughter, my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues in a way that they can understand. My native a Calgarian Patreon account, account is where you can pledge and support. Thank you previous donors for already showing your support. If you value listening and listening to my rant, I don't know how, first and foremost, so I'm grateful. Thank you, I annoyed myself. If you can afford to give, thank you. If you can't, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com where you can send in your comments or questions. I also have a YouTube channel now. You can subscribe. You can go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts. And I want to end with giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not tradish. My beautiful cousin responded, or you'd be in my dish. So thank you for listening.